All right, we're live. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joanne Manister, <laughs> Science Goddess on Twitter, sitting here in central Illinois, final exams week ooh, uh, at our university. And we are joined, as always, by my co-host, Jeff, on the East Coast, Maryland. Yes. And then Phil Plate, who I've been, I have met, but I've been dying to talk to in this kind of format for at least 15 years. And uh, so he's, um, we'll, we'll introduce him in a minute more fully, but Phil is um, an astronomer, PhD in astronomy. And uh, the reason why I say I wanted to talk to him 15 years ago, because he had started with, well, you had another book called Bad Astronomy, and you are called The Bad Astronomer. But your book uh, that I was introduced to your writing more thoroughly was Death from the Skies. These are the ways the world will end. And I swear I read this book like four or five times. <laughs> so <laughs> That's more than I did. maybe <laughs> maybe I was worried the world was actually going to end. But but back then I was not we weren't Jeff and I had not met and we weren't doing uh, chatting with uh, authors yet. But um, I was making book reviews and stuff. And now we're talking to authors, which I think is much more fun, much more fun, much more fun. But we are today joined by Phil because he has written a new book, Under Alien Skies, A Sightseer's Guide to the Universe. And uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Phil's writing, it's very friendly and I think, and scientific. So two things we like in a good popular science book. And I'm going to formally introduce Phil instead of talking about myself here. Uh, Phil Plate is an astronomer, sci-fi dork. TV documentary Talking Head and all around science enthusiast, as well as creator, uh, creator and star of Crash Course Astronomy. He is the author of Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies, which I just showed you. And you write the Bad Astronomy newsletter living in Colorado. So now we are in three time zones today. <laughs> the magic of video. Yeah. Can we call somebody in California real quick and I'm in here? Yeah, let's see who we wants could. to join us. <laughs> maybe London, maybe Africa. We've been around the world. Wow, that would be uh, terrifying, actually. <laughs> yeah. In the morning, my time, and I'm already like struggling to stay awake. So yeah, I don't want to get anybody who's in the middle of middle of the night or something like that. And I apologize. I was just letting people know that we're live. So I'm like, great. Introducing me, and I'm like, you know, checking Twitter. You know what? That's okay here. <laughs> That's all right. So, Jeff, would you, I assume you have a question because you take good notes when you read and think yes, about these things. Yes, and, and I have notes. Usually, I, I write down quotations of astounding things with exclamation points, uh, <laughs> and, and then I, I say them, hoping that you'll say something astounding about them. But I have, I have a two-part question. And the first, I thought, Under Alien Skies is a very poetic name. And just to be clear, what we're talking about, I thought I would ask you, for your elevator proposal for the book, just so we have a context for everything that we're going to talk about without, you know, an overlong introduction that way before I dive into the middle of everything. Oh, so that's it. Okay. That's, a that's the first part. part. <laughs> that's the first part. Uh, sure. The elevator pitch is that um, a lot of people ask me when I show astronomy pictures online or mm -hmm. when I let people look through a telescope, they asked me, is this what it would look like if I were at this place, if I were there? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no, but it's typically uh, not shown very well in science fiction movies and stuff like that. And I didn't want to, I don't want to have a book where it's just, this is what you would see. This is describing Saturn, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to bring the reader into these places, sort of uh, uh, dump them in there, surround them with this, and let them experience what it's really like to be there. So it's more than just uh, a, a description. It's more, it's more like you are there. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? Uh, and uh, based on the most current science I could find, sometimes so current that uh, between the time I typed the last word and it got published, things changed. Um, not, not for the worst, hopefully, but, but like some of the stuff in, in the book is so cutting edge that, that actually in the past few months, we've actually learned more about yeah. that. So it's, it's kind of fun. And, um, that's what I want. I want somebody to be immersed in this environment and experience it. One thing, and this, this is the part that's kind of in the middle of everything, but maybe halfway through the book, 
uh, I'm, I'm going to quote something here because I lived through this and it was an astounding time. And I'll, the, the popular press barely noticed, but they took notice after a while. You wrote in the 1990s, the universe had nine planets. Well, nine planets that we knew of. And the question is, what happened between then and now that has like filled half of your book and, and <laughs> really astounded us? Well, Pluto got demoted, so then there became eight. Yes, I thought um, at first, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what happened is we just we discovered planets orbiting other stars, and um, for me, this is one of the greatest astronomy, one of the greatest human discoveries of of the recent era. I mean, there's a lot of there. You could make a big list of that, but I think finding these planets would be pretty high up. Because for centuries, we've looked for other planets in our own solar system, and, and there may yet be other planets out there really far away that are very dim and hard to find. Um, but looking for planets around other stars is really, really hard. And we didn't know if they even existed. We, we had ideas for how the planets around the sun formed. But a lot of these ideas were really would be really rare events like another star passed really close mm -hmm. to the sun and pulled material off and this cooled to form planets this was a running idea for a long time uh, it doesn't work um but it turns out uh those kind of stellar encounters are incredibly rare but if that's how it works uh you don't expect to find planets mm -hmm. around other stars very often so we didn't know how that was working and then we started getting closer uh you know we, we found stars that were acting a little funny giving off a little bit too much infrared light, which kind of indicated there was stuff around them that might be warmed and glowing thermally. And, and step by step, we got to the point where uh, most astronomers are thinking, yeah, we think planets might be common. And then in the 1990s, we started finding them. Um, and at first there was a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. you know, are these observations real? Because they were indirect. We weren't seeing the planets. We were seeing the planets pass in front of their star. So I think this is a star. And the planet would do this and it would block a little bit of the light from the star and it could be a lot of different things causing that effect. Uh, and then um, one of them was predicted. It was seen over and over again. And they said, you know what? We think it, this, this dimming of starlight is going to happen again at this time. Mm -hmm. And it did. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, everybody was like, yeah, these are planets. Yeah. Uh, and it, once, once we figured out, it's like, these actually are planets and they're not that hard to find. Not, I mean, it's not that easy, but it's not like, super difficult observation. Uh, NASA launched a telescope that was dedicated to finding them and then another one and now the European Space Agency has one and now we have found thousands of them and we know that there are planets, there are probably planets outnumbering stars in the galaxy and a lot of stars have multiple planets and it's more than just finding these planets, we're starting to categorize them. So mm -hmm. some kinds of stars are really good at making planets, some aren't, some make big planets, some make little ones. And it's just amazing. It's an entirely new field of science that popped up almost overnight in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah. the way the way I remember it from from then, it's like it seemed like it took 30 years worth of work by everyone to find one, and then lo and behold, a second planet, and then before you know it, they're coming a hundred at a time. And it was just, it was astounding and overwhelming. It's its pretty it's, much like that. The story, I, I don't want to spend like an hour talking about how we discovered planets, yeah. <laughs> but the story, the original story of how these planets were discovered is actually really cool. And, uh, you know, if it were in a movie, you'd go, well, that's silly. Uh, yeah. And that, yes. that happens you know, a lot in real life. Like really strange coincidences happen. Uh, and I've, I actually gave a local TED talk about it, uh, TEDx Boulder. And uh, it got picked up by the TED main page. So if you look up um, mistakes in science mm -hmm. with my name, you'll find the video and I talk about how that all worked. That is cool. And now one, if we can do one more little background thing that I made a sure. note about was to ask you to, to recap what the current thinking is about how stars and planets form. Well, basically, um, you have a big gas cloud in space, and there are, these things are everywhere. Um, and I, I, mean, I think the, the thing behind that was what you mentioned is, is it a rare thing to have planets or likely not a rare thing? To have oh, planets? it's not rare at all. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I'm not going to say it's unusual for a star to not have planets because we don't have mm -hmm. um, really firm statistics on that. But um, my guess is that 
more stars will have planets than ones that won't. The planet making process is a natural part of the star making process. Mm -hmm. They both collapse out of gas. I mean, you, you get a gas cloud, it collapses down um, for reasons and there are complicated steps involved. But in the center the star starts to form, you get a, a disk of material around that star. It, it starts off as a cloud, but it collapses down into a disk because of the way particles interact and all that stuff moves. Uh, and that, that disk can then start to form planets either um, from the ground up, you form like grains of dust, which stick together to form rocks and the rocks stick together to form boulders and then boom, planets. Or the disk basically is so big that parts of it can itself collapse down and form planets directly. And that's called the top down method. And that's maybe how um, a lot of bigger planets are formed, ones even bigger than Jupiter. But the point is, these disks are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, and um, they, it just appears that planets are just a natural outcome of making stars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, I just want to point out, so your book is not just words on a page, you have some drawings. I doubt this will be visible for everybody, but this was the mm -hmm. drawing to show about the dimming of the light from a star. And I'd like to thank whoever your artist was. Because Chris Jones. Chris Jones. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I remember you said Zach Wienersmith had recommended. Yes, Zach's that's right. has been on our show before. Uh, so Finding an illustrator is an interesting problem. And it's not something um, you kind of think of when you write a book, necessarily, a nonfiction <laughs> book. It's like, yes, these concepts are going to be impossible to describe. Uh, or I can describe them. But it's really like best. This. Oh, God, that one. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, this seasons. one is... S-type planet, seasons yes, on an S-type planet. Sort of seasons when you have a planet orbiting a star and there's another star orbiting that star too. So that's you're in a right. binary star system and you're orbiting one of those planets. Uh, and describing it was interesting. It's really hard to actually get a good description um, without like boring somebody or confusing them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I need an illustrator. And um, the, the publishers typically don't pay for that. So it's like, I need a cheap illustrator. Um, <laughs> and I went online and started poking around at these sort of message board job site kind of things. And nobody, nobody had what I wanted. So I was like, well, I have friends who write books. Let me ask them. So I asked mm -hmm. Zach Wiener Smith, who does Saturday morning breakfast cereal mm -hmm. and has written um, many Soonish. popular Soonish. books. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Soonish with his wife, Kelly Wiener Smith. Mm -hmm. They've got a book coming out called a city on Mars, which is I saw that. great. Um, and it's great. I, out, I saw the preview for it, but I'm like, ah, I got yeah, it comes out in November. It's available November. for pre-order. So, you know, I suggest people read it. It's really good about space exploration. And he said, Hey, I've got this guy. I know Chris Jones, uh, up in Canada. So I talked to Chris and he was great. He, he was reasonably priced, which, you know, as a, a, a penurious author, that was good. He did really great illustrations. Uh, and, uh, some of the, some of the concepts are a little difficult. You have to wrap your head around it, And that's kind of the point that um, what we experience here on Earth is one planet orbiting one star at a certain distance. It's a certain kind of star in a certain part of the galaxy. And it turns out none of these things is uh, a rule that you need to have for a planet. They can orbit much closer to their star, mm -hmm. different kinds of stars, different parts of the galaxy, and you will see different things. So just even describing the setting can be a little strange because you're just not used to it. And if you're not some astronomy nerd like I am and, and you know, eat, live, breathe, drink this stuff, um, you have to kind of back out and go from first principles and say, yeah, we orbit a star. That's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. And just, and, uh, well, fun. Speaking of uh, saving money, you have NASA photos, they're, right? They're, so they're good are, photos. They're great photos and they're here for, <laughs> for us to all use. And yeah, they're prepaid, your tax dollars at work. That wasn't right. to save money. Um, but, but I mean, they're the people who have the photos right? versus someone who's had to like dig them up somewhere and go, well, oh, I wonder what that's gonna cost. But well, it, it, just, more so people know, if you didn't know, together. you can use government photos for free. Yeah. Yes, and, you and paid more, for even more importantly than that, um, is not so much that, is that if you're lazy, and let me tell you, People think writing a book is like this. It, 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 it's a lot of work and it's very hard. Mm -hmm. But like every author I know, except for, well, not every author, but a lot of authors I know, we're lazy. Writers writers typically are like, oh, mm -hmm. I have to write today. It's like, mm -hmm. right, you want to eat, you got to write. Um, in fact, what's great about NASA photos and European Space Agency photos and National Optical Observatory uh, uh, photos, National, wait a minute, I got that wrong, National 
Optical Astronomical Observatory, NOAO, European Southern Observatory, all of these consortiums of observatories is, um, there you don't have to get permission mm -hmm. to use their images. Mm -hmm. Their images are out there. You just have to give a credit line that they say, use this, give us this credit line. Mm -hmm. I don't have to send forms and emails and contact people, which is great. I can just find that image and go, this is what I need, and then send it to the publisher, and it saves me a lot of grief. So yeah, I've got great photos in there, yes. um, but they were easy. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I listened on audio, but I'm glad I had the book. Oh, I heard the narrator was terrible, though. No, the narrator was wonderful. The narrator was Phil. <laughs> I actually and, narrated the book, yeah. Yes. I, well, I mean, you knew. Because he knows how to pronounce about, the names. Pronounce the names. But yeah. you, you think um, there were two names, <laughs> and it's like, you know, uh, uh, there's a moon of Mars, D E I M O S. Uh -huh. Deimos, Deimos, Deimos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which uh, one? <laughs> uh, and I think it's Deimos. I mean, it just depends. It's it's Greek. And who uses ancient Greek to pronounce things now? We, we've corrupted all of these well, pronunciations. But there are times I had to look stuff up. <laughs> Biologist. Well, yeah. no, but we use it for words like, what, equinoctes, which I'm perfectly sure. fine with. Which is the plural <laughs> of equinox, but nobody yeah. actually Has anyone ever me. asked Deimos what they want to be called? <laughs> <laughs> and it will say nothing because it's just a giant so, potato-shaped rock. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I want, right. <laughs> I want to add a little gloss for people watching who may not realize yet that when you say the book is about what it looks like if you're in other places, that's literally true. Yeah. We travel around the solar system and then we travel around other planets. We land on them somehow or we orbit them fictionally and then narratively. And we look at the sky from that viewpoint to see what we can see, to see what it's like to be on there. Mm -hmm to see what it's like to be there. Uh, and that that is such a natural perspective in a way that nobody has ever done. And it's it's compelling and it's also illuminating. Yeah. We saw a I lot of things. I appreciate that we were garbed appropriately. Yeah. Like you took into account, you can't breathe here. You might be freezing. Yes. Here's your fictional suit that you're wearing totally appreciate you adding right. that because of course there'll be people like come on yeah. you know <laughs> well, well i mean basically every place in the universe except earth will kill you within seconds mm -hmm. and um <laughs> even earth even earth is we talk about something being earth-like and i'm like what part of earth is do you mean you know i live i live in colorado and and i can see mountaintops out the side of my window and outside and um if you go to the top of there you're not going to live very long that's at fourteen thousand feet it's tall enough that you can breathe, but it's cold and, and it's dangerous. Uh, but it, it turns out a lot of planets are like that. So yeah, I mean, if you're on the moon and, and you, and I'm going to bring you to the moon and say, here's what you, here's what you experience. It's going to be in a suit or you're going to be in a, you know, in your space hotel, uh, because a lot of the times you're a tourist at these places in the book. And, um, so you're looking out a window, you're comfortable in your room, but you're looking out the window and seeing say the lunar landscape. Um, and to do that, I mix it up a little bit because I didn't want to just repeat the same formula over and over again, mm -hmm. but each chapter starts with a short story. It's a fiction story of somebody being in this place and typ uh, typically getting in trouble or something like that. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> I'll go back. That's how the, that's how the chapter starts. And then the, the nonfiction part of the chapter, I'll, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say, you know, Saturn has been observed since time immemorial, that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. build up to um, bringing you back there. And sometimes I'll go back and forth. Uh, sometimes it's just you're there. Let's talk about the science. Uh, but it was a lot of fun writing those fictional vignettes. I did that for Death from the Skies, Joanne. Was yes, just that. yes. Um, and I thought it was a fun idea um, because a lot of these things are so esoteric that it's hard to know, you know, even, even as I'm describing it as a reader, it's like, well, what's going on? So I started with like mm -hmm. sort of a, you are there second person kind of a thing. And that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed writing those. And um, I, I guess I'm kind of a frustrated science fiction writer. Um, and <laughs> it, it was easier than writing, plotting out an entire novel. You know, it's just a single scene. Like you're buried in an asteroid or you're floating over the rings of Saturn or something like that. And it was, um, I felt that this was a, a way of priming the reader 
in, yeah. in, in the experience. So it's not just going to be me talking about it. It's going to be you experiencing it. I found it really scary the way, uh, I forget which asteroid it was, the small one of uh, the idea of jumping slowly out of my uh, orbiting spacecraft and almost sinking over my head into the asteroid because it's just a loose conglomeration. That was scary. <laughs> it's my claustrophobia acting up, I think. I see, yeah. Well, the, the oh. opening vignette is a is, uh, space explorer buried, um, you know, 30 feet or so in, inside of an asteroid because a lot of these small asteroids are just piles of rocks. They're not solid rocks like you would find in, you know, outside in your garden or something like that. And this was a relatively recent discovery uh, that, that these small ones probably undergo collisions with other asteroids that, that shatter them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's enough to actually blow them apart a little bit, but then their gravity pulls them back together. And what you're left with is a bag of rocks. And the gravity is so low, and these things are so loosely bound, that it would be like, you know, going to um, a, a ball pit at a carnival or something like that and mm -hmm. trying to stand on it. You don't. You sink. <laughs> and so if you, you know, jump onto one of these asteroids, you can sink into it. And one of our probes, this happened. It actually started. It was it was designed to go to the surface of an asteroid. This is OSIRIS-REx, the name mm -hmm. of the spacecraft, to the surface of an asteroid called Bennu. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to basically touch the surface and collect samples to send mm -hmm. back to Earth. But this thing, this probe buried itself 18 inches, it was 40 centimeters, something like that, into the asteroid before the spacecraft basically used retro jets, mm -hmm. cold gas to blow itself in the other direction. And if it hadn't have done that, uh, yeah, the whole thing could have maybe sunk into the asteroid. It's not clear. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that is strange and unexpected mm -hmm. uh, and something... Uh, that I thought would be a really fun way to open the chapter because it really does give you a visceral sense of just how weird these asteroids can be. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's completely non-intuitive. You know, who would have thought of this before we discovered it? You know, and I'm so happy. It's not just NASA doing everything. NASA, NASA, NASA. We've got ESA and we've got Jackson. We've got, yeah, everybody's getting in on the game. And I feel like that's just really helpful for space exploration in general. Yeah, the other half of that asteroid chapter is exploring a comet, which mm -hmm. comets are very similar to asteroids, and they have some differences. And uh, the European Space Agency landed, well, they orbited a uh, comet, 67P churyumov gerasimenko <laughs> Well done. Off the tongue. Yeah, full, good, um, job. good job. <laughs> and uh, Chugu, a lot of people call it, or Chuga, uh, or 67P, which is easier. <laughs> and uh, this Rosetta probe orbited it for years and also sent a lander down, Philae, and it didn't work. The lander kind of crash landed and skipped mm -hmm. around and fell over on its side. And I talk about that in the book, but um, yeah, that was the European Space Agency mission. And so I, I mixed it up a little bit for some of these because um, look, you know, there are a lot of different countries out there doing this exploration. Uh, Hubble is a part ESA mission. Uh, um, what was I just thinking? Oh, Cassini, uh, mm -hmm. which orbited Saturn for 13 years. And the Saturn chapter has a lot of stuff Basically, it's, it's all Cassini all the time because we learned so much. That was also a multiple nation mission. So, yeah, we're all out there looking for this stuff. And it just goes to show you how universal, I hate to use that term, uh, <laughs> means something different to an astronomer than an anthropologist, but how universal that urge to, to discover is in humanity. Yes. I thought just before, before we started, I was putting my notes together and things that maybe I should look up and see if I could find... Uh, some Rosetta video of a volcano exploding, one you know, an exovolcano, because those are a big thing. And I didn't in the first five minutes, but realized when, when Joanne was talking about, you were talking about the availability of uh, NASA images, which is a great thing. And fortunately, NASA realized early on that it helps to engage the public and they've made it part of their official mission. Oh, yeah. If oh, you wow. want to see videos from any of these things you can see videos by looking at youtube searching you can see all this stuff uh which is so cool and a big change from um another thing that takes me way back you know the cover of i think scientific american when the first exovolcano was seen was bad grainy and that was the only place you could see it at the time right. but that was astounding too and and now it's it's commonplace but sometimes it does astound me that all of these things are here in my computer uh, where I can just go and look at them because I have the notion. And that, 
that's sort of an underappreciated aspect of all these countries doing all this exploration. Right. A lot of so so for example, with Rosetta, uh, there are all of the images that this thing took of the comet, um, of Osiris Rex, of Bennu, uh, the Japanese space agency's uh, mission. Um, uh, Hayabusa 2 to uh, the asteroid Ryugu. These are all available online and Cassini images, all this stuff. It's, they're all free. And, um, you know, amateur citizen scientists, whatever term you want to mm -hmm. use, um, people can just go into these databases, pull the images out, process them if they know what they're doing and, and create videos. And this is something uh, I, I guess I, I never really thought about it back in the day when I was first starting to do this kind of thing. But uh, you can learn how to do it and and you don't have to be an astronomer just somebody who knows how to use a computer and and photoshop or, or some uh, animation tools and there are people out there that do this just for funsies and uh there's one person on twitter landrew 79 maybe getting that wrong um but this person takes lots of images from um uh, say rosetta of the comet so take take uh they'll take um 10 images in a row, 20 images in a row, something like that, clean them up, string them together in an animation to make it go back and forth. So you see sort of the comet doing this ah. and it gives you a real 3D sense of what's mm -hmm. going on, especially since there's water ice under the surface and as it gets warmed by the sun, that'll blow out water, uh, uh, gas, water vapor, essentially. Um, and you see these vents shooting off the comet. So not only do you see the structure of a comet moving, you see these vents sticking out of it. it really gives an overwhelming 3D feeling to it. It's just phenomenal. And it turns these things in you know, from you know, static photos, things you might see in a book or magazine, like you're saying, into worlds, into places that become real. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just amazing, the talent out there. So it, mm. it, it's super easy to find people who do this and just follow them on social media. And I'm astonished every single day there is something I hadn't seen before. Uh, and that just, just destroys my mind because it, it's a video of another world, another planet, something like that, that you're seeing up close because we've sent uh, robots there. It's a, it's a new age, you make me realize, a new age of astronomy as a science where you learn a lot just by looking at things, if you can yeah. see it. I mean, um, yeah, uh, it, it helps to do more than just that. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, it, mm -hmm. it, there's a lot you can learn by, by just taking pictures. Um, taking pictures with different filters, so you have different mm -hmm. colors, different mm -hmm. very specific colors can tell you the composition of an object as well as things like um, how fast it's spinning, its temperature, all kinds of things like that. Um, but uh, also spectra, which break the light up into like a rainbow. Uh, and also with these space probes, we're getting samples. Cassini, yeah. uh, well, uh, uh, Bennu uh, and Ryugu, the two asteroids, they, we have samples of them. Uh, one has already come back to Earth. Uh, we're getting another one end of the year, I think, or September. Cassini flew through the geyser plume of uh, Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. Love that. Love yeah, that. And that that That's was one of my a favorite shocking things. discovery. Mm -hmm. When it looked at Enceladus, this little moon, it's like 300 miles across, icy moon of Saturn. Should have been dead. Hmm? Should have been dead and cold. Yeah, you think it would just be this this frozen ice, ice sphere out there because it's 600 million miles from the sun. But Saturn's gravity is stretching and squeezing this moon, creating friction in the interior that is generating so much energy, so much heat, it's melted the interior and created an ocean of water under the surface. And there are cracks in the surface where this water spews out into space and geysers. And Cassini saw them. And when they realized these things were real, they flew Cassini through them mm -hmm. at a safe distance to basically uh, detect particles in there. And it detected heavy organic molecules, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily biological, but carbon-based molecules. So uh, that means that, you know, there's a lot, could be a lot of stuff going on under the surface of this moon. So there's a lot of ways of, of doing what we call remote sensing, of, of finding out more about these worlds. And the fact that we're sending probes to them, you know, it takes a long time, it took 10 years to get to Saturn, uh, it's still, uh, it's worth the wait. I mean, we got a helicopter on Mars. We're sending a helicopter to Titan, yeah. Saturn's <laughs> largest moon. And this is all just sci-fi stuff, and we're making it real. It's amazing. Sarah Horst is the the one going to Titan, or is that one? 
Sarah Hurst is a um, is called Dragonfly. A, she's a planetary scientist. Yeah. Uh, uh, Janie Radbaugh is another friend of mine who is another scientist working on the Dragonfly mission. And this is the, it's it's a, it's basically a helicopter. It's a little yeah. more complicated than that. <laughs> sure, but, sure. <laughs> um, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn, and it has an atmosphere, and the atmosphere is actually quite dense. Uh, and the gravity is much lower than Earth's. So flying a helicopter on it, it's actually, it's a drone, essentially, um, is easier there than it is here, except for the fact that it's like super cold on mm -hmm. Titan. So uh, it has to be heavily fortified against that. Uh, but the idea that you can, you can orbit a world, a moon, a planet, something from space, you can land on it. Uh, and see what's around you in that one spot. We've done that. You can send rovers, which are very important, but very slow. They don't, you know, they, they might go a hundred yards a day and look around. Mm -hmm. They can, they, it, it, what they're doing is amazing. Take samples and take pictures and all that stuff. But the idea of having a drone, a helicopter means you can fly. You say, I want to go over there and fly there and be there in a couple of minutes mm -hmm. and do all your science and everything and send that back to earth and then go to the next spot. Uh, and fly over hills. You know, if there's a big ditch, a uh, gully or something, a rover can't go over that necessarily, but a helicopter just beep, whoop, just pops right over it. So I think that's going to be uh, a phenomenal advance in planetary science. Very excited about that. And of course, it's not going to not going to launch for another you know some years. It's going to take right. ten years to get there. So that's right. Yeah, uh, we'll all dust old and gray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Uh, you know, you were saying, so let's say a rover goes 100 yards and you go, well, that perspective doesn't change so much. What amazed me, and I should know this, but I never gave it thought, <laughs> how far away you had to go for your perspective of our solar system to really change. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow. OK. You know, you're on Saturn. You're like, OK, things aren't that much. You know, the sun's a little further. And, you know, but it was really getting out of our solar system before we started to see a big change. That's right. That struck um, me in the book. The places you go are different. The moon is very different than the earth. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and the big difference there, besides you know not having an atmosphere, is that instead of having the moon in your sky, you have the earth in your sky. So I spend a bit of time talking about that. But the sun, I mean, you, you've only traveled a quarter of a million miles, and the sun is 90 million miles away. So the sun looks the same. Stars look the same. Even on Mars... The sun's going to look smaller, but we don't spend a lot of time looking at the sun. So it'll be <laughs> different, you know, but similar. But it's not until you start, I mean, Saturn now, you're starting to talk about, um, well, it's it's 600 million miles. So the sun is going to be a, a sixth of the size it is in the sky now. Mm -hmm. And at Pluto, um, the sun is, is very small. But... Uh, and there's a lot of misinformation about this. If you read story after story, especially from many years ago, of explorers on Pluto, and the sun is just another star in the sky. And it's like, no, yeah. the sun is 50 times brighter than the full moon mm -hmm. uh, and still visible as a disk, a small one. So it'd make your eyes water to look at it. So it's still very bright. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not until you start going to other stars that, say, the constellations will look different. And even then, uh, you know, I write about Trappist-1, which is a red dwarf, a yeah. tiny, cool, faint star that we know has seven planets orbiting it that are roughly the size of the Earth, um, three of which are at the rough distance they need to be to be Earth-like, to mm -hmm. have temperatures that are like Earth's. Um, and that's 40 light years away. And even from that distance, like the Big Dipper will be distorted and Orion will be distorted, but you'll still see them. Or you'll still, Orion will still pretty... Kind of, you know, kind of look like Orion because those stars are still much farther away. Uh, so it's kind of amazing. You can go to another star and still see relatively familiar constellations. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be actually worse than going halfway across the galaxy and seeing completely <laughs> different <All> stars. <laughs> because I've been to Australia, and uh, the, the when I was there, I saw like I would look over towards the north and I could see oh there's Vega and Denim mm -hmm. and all these stars I'm familiar with, and then I would look to the south and it's like oh, these are completely unfamiliar <laughs> constellations. So it was really strange, like going back to your old house that you grew up in as a kid, and it's mm -hmm. like somebody else lives there. And it's like, it's kind of familiar, but distressingly unfamiliar. So I think, yeah, if, if I had to visit these places, I'd be happier going like 5,000 light years away than something really close. It would freak me out. My, my physicist side really appreciates the way you work in without being scary about it. 
things like the geometric effects of like, well, we're twice as far away. So there's only a quarter of much uh, light that's reached us and various things like that. And also the difference between uh, weight and mass and inertial problems, which experience says people just don't understand <laughs> until they push a very right. large, heavy thing around and try to turn it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're if you had like a, a, a I don't know, I'm just making this up, a bank safe on a dolly, yeah, right. And you think in my, well, in my lab, it was a big uh, doer of uh, liquid nitrogen on wheels, and I always love telling people, would you, like, would you take this down to the hall into that lab on the right? And they'd be going along, and they'd get to this. I say, stop, stop, yeah. stop, because they're trying to turn. But that is one massive thing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in space. You don't have any weight, but you still have mass. It's only mm -hmm. it's only gravity affecting that mass that you feel as weight. So if I have to pick up something heavy on Earth, you know, it's oh, it's this huge force. But in space, you could apply a very low force to it. It just takes a long time to get it moving. But again, if you want it to stop, you know, it's hard to stop. So it may be it may not have much weight, um, but it still has mass and inertia. So this is not something people maybe necessarily know about unless they, you know, think back to their eighth grade earth science class when they did experiments like that. But, uh, you know, I can't ignore it because on the moon, if you're walking around or you see it something like, oh, I'm going to trot over there, um, you have to stop. And even though you feel like you only weigh 50 pounds or 25 pounds, uh, stopping yourself is still really hard. And you, you watch the video of the Apollo astronauts, they fall down a lot. And that's, mm -hmm. Part of the problem, I mean, that problem is all inertia. Part of the problem is also balance. Mm -hmm. you, you feel like you can reach over and grab something, and it turns out you overbalance a lot. You, and you, you, if you drop something, you, you reach too quickly for it, that kind of thing, reflex. And that's why they fell down a lot. But it was, it's a problem. And if you want to, or if I want to describe um, you being on the moon, walking around, that's an important thing to, to mm -hmm. realize. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the same if you're if you're weightless or very nearly weightless on an asteroid or something like that. Uh, it just fundamental stuff that you take for granted every day. Just breathing, living, right. standing up, sitting down, lying down. These are all very different on uh, on the moon than they, they are on Earth. And that so that's something I really wanted to talk about and and not just mm -hmm. skim over, but really talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's fun to, to think about how different things are on these other worlds. Well, it's nicely integrated into the stories mm -hmm. and and the whole exposition. And that, that made me wonder too, there's some of these things like, you know, the geometric, uh, how much light gets to here because it's twice as far away as stuff. You know, even I could figure out because it's, it's the simple physics stuff. For things like landing on exoplanets around binary stars or red dwarfs uh, and deciding what you see when it's this and that. Did you have some tools to use to visualize that? Yeah. I had science and <laughs> what's in here. Tell us about it. Was, it. Mostly cauliflower <laughs> in there. Um, uh, or yeah, some so, software or just... Uh, oh, well, uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, I'll give you a, a brief example. Uh, sadly, it's not that brief, but um, it's okay. It's okay. We know that the, the moon, the moon spins once for every time it goes around the mm -hmm. earth. And that's why we always see one face. You look at the moon, you're always seeing the same face of the moon. Uh, the obverse converse of that the is that you're on the moon <laughs> and you look up and you see the earth in the sky. And this is what you always read. The earth doesn't move. It's always in the same spot in the sky. It never rises and sets. That's not strictly true mm -hmm. because the moon's orbit is elliptical and tilted a little bit. We sometimes, as, as it, it gets closer and farther to the earth, we can sometimes see a little bit around the eastern and western edge and the northern and southern edge. So we can actually see a little bit onto the far side. Mm -hmm. and, and so from us, our perspective, the moon isn't just locked into one face. It actually appears to kind of rock and tip like this. There, there are videos of that, yeah, of simulations yeah. of that. They're actually quite mesmerizing. It's going to it gets bigger and smaller mm -hmm. and it's making this motion. It's actually quite, quite fun to watch. <laughs> but what that means is the earth is moving in the sky. And I thought, well, how much does it move? It can't be very much. Right. And I tried to do the math and the math was super hard. Uh, the trig was a little bit tougher than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I said, well, I'll just do some planetarium software. Somebody's got, you know, Stellarium, which is this online software. It's free. And you can sit yourself on the moon and look at the earth cool. and then run the clock forward really fast. And you can watch the earth moving back and forth. And it moves a lot, many, many degrees. I mean, it's, uh, 
uh, many times the Earth's own width back and forth. And that means that if you were on the edge of the moon, that, that, that borderline between the near and the far side, as seen from Earth, you could actually watch the Earth rise and set over the horizon over the course of one moon orbit, which takes a month. Mm-hmm. So you could see sort of the Earth rise up, peak a little bit off the horizon, then set again, mm-hmm. and then come back up every month. And that shocked me. I was not expecting that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And if I hadn't had that software, that would have been a lot tougher to figure out. I think I found somebody who wrote about it, and they said it was a lot, and I thought that can't be right. And then I checked it out. And I was like, oh, wow, it really is a lot. And for things like for things like um, a planet orbiting a red dwarf, it's the same situation. The gravity of the star and the planet will eventually slow the planet's spin so that it always shows the same mm-hmm. face of the star. Mm-hmm. So if you're on the side of the planet facing the star, it's always day. It, the sun never sets. And if you're on the other side, it's always night. The, the sun never rises. Uh, and so just thinking about that, and I've thought about this for years, and there have mm-hmm. been books about this, um, uh, science fiction stories and things like that. But uh, scientists have started taking this seriously because we're discovering planets around these stars. And it's like, well, what's the weather like on a planet yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, and we, and <laughs> if you go back into the 60s when this idea was first kind of coming up, you'd have this desert side of the planet and then the frozen side of the planet where it was like absolute zero on one side and broiling hot on the other. And it turns out, no, because atmospheres carry heat. And so if you heat one side of a planet with an atmosphere, that air will rise up and flow to the other side and warm it up. And subsequently, the cool air will sink and flow along the ground to the day side of the planet and and cool it off. And uh, I was just thinking about it. And I read a couple of papers. They didn't go into a lot of details. But it occurred to me, it's like, well, at the day night side where there's a big temperature change, Mm -hmm. uh, there'd be storms, you Mm -hmm. know, and and I see that here in Colorado. Uh, we, we get uh, storms in the afternoon because of the way, uh, Mm -hmm. the way the, the, the the heating and and cooling works. So I thought, well, maybe there's perpetual storms ringing the planet. Uh, and, and you can, you know, so you can always sort of say, oh, the star is that way. And the big storm is that way. So I must be facing North right now. You can, Mm -hmm. you know, get your sense of direction from that and, and it was kind of fun to write about, like, well, if we have a base on that planet, if there's a city on that planet, what would you see? And, mm-hmm. and uh, like, like another thing, uh, this is something I didn't think of until I was sitting down actually writing it. And I thought, well, if it's a red dwarf, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, the sky can't be blue because these stars don't yeah. put out any blue light. Um, so the sky might be red, but even red light doesn't scatter that well. It, you know, if you just have your atmosphere and, and red star, uh, the sky is more likely to be black. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think I said it was a red tinted atmosphere and I think it, it, it could be, um, but it could also just be black. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it just depends mm-hmm. on, on what the situation, I mean, Mars has a red atmosphere because of dust suspended yeah. in the air. Mm-hmm. So it, really the color of your sky changes depending on what's going on too. So and it, that it, it was sunset the whole on Mars was blue. Is that right? Yes. That, uh, that's that was new to me. Situation. <laughs> And we have, we have photos of that. There are rovers on Mars that take pictures of the sky. Mm-hmm. And you can see the sky is sort of a, an ochre, orange, butterscotch color. And then as the sun sets, and, that, and that's because the dust in the air, I should say, is rust. It's iron oxide. It's, it's mm-hmm. very fine grain rust. And so it tints the sky reddish. But near sunset, that same dust tends to take the blue light from the sun and send it toward you. So the sky around the, the sun looks blue, which is the opposite of what we have here, you, know, you have blue skies during the day and red skies at sunset and the sun looks red. It's the opposite on Mars. It's red skies during the day and blue sky at sunset. Weird and fun. Yeah, and oh, yeah, there yeah. it is. Sure, it's to prove it. I mean, yeah, yep. Yep. That's, um, that's an actual photo from Spirit. Yes, the Spirit Rover. Spirit uh, Rover. And you can see yeah. the sky sort of sky sort of red, red or, 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 or butterscotch. And then right around the sun, it's blue. Mm-hmm. A little bit difficult to see there, but it, it, yeah. um, if you buy the book, you'll see it. That's true. Yeah. I suggest I suggest you do so. Yeah. Or you can, you know, go online and, and type, you know, spirit that, yeah. sunset too. photo and you'll find <laughs> that. So for, for all of the people who might be watching and are jaded who already know that asteroids are much further apart in the asteroid belt than we see it in any uh <laughs> Star Wars movie, uh, there are still astounding things to learn. It just one after another of what things actually look like from some place. Well, if they know that fact, they may know it because of me. Um, yes. Just to, yes. just to toot my own horn. I mean, that's what an author's supposed to do. I mean, back, back in the day. When I the think that's why I knew. Knew, 
I was I was sort of writing about myths and misconceptions in astronomy, sort of short articles about it. And one of the ones that really got to me is how you know every movie has asteroid belts with asteroids everywhere. Yeah. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's who's an asteroid scientist, and he was telling me it's like, yeah, the average distance between you know there, <laughs> there may be let me back up a little bit and say there may be as many as a billion with a B, a billion mm -hmm. asteroids in the solar system, large as large as say a football field, hundred yards across. Um, but they're so far apart, there's so much room out there, that standing on the surface of one, you're unlikely to see another one in your sky. They'd all be too wow. far away, too faint to see. Mm -hmm. um, that's true even for big asteroids. Um, mm -hmm. And it's weird because like the, two of the biggest asteroids are visible by the naked eye on Earth, barely. One of them is sometimes, and the other one's a little bit tough, but you know, it's technically possible. And you think, well, if you're there... You know, it, 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 they'd be closer. And so, and it turns out, no, because when you go farther out from the sun, there's more real estate out there. There's even more, on average, these asteroids are farther, are farther from you than they are from Earth. And so they're invisible. And that, that still is, is one, of those, one of those things that's like, that is completely counterintuitive, especially given all the, you know, Empire Strikes Back and all the movies we yeah. see. So, and I wrote about that a long time ago. And I still have to hammer that sometimes when I see movies. And it's like, no. No, they're far apart. You know, you, if you want to get to an asteroid, you have to aim for one. It's not yeah. like mm -hmm. every spaceship that flies through the asteroid belt, they're pinging it all over yeah. yeah, That's right. Top yeah, it's not like that at all. <laughs> what that's that's the you know, someplace while we were talking, I was gonna say the universe is so big, and then it's even bigger than that. And and trying to grasp the magnitude of one of my favorite, favorite things is how much hydrogen the sun burns. So your version of that is the sun fuses 700 million tons of hydrogen into 695 million tons of helium every second. Yes. Which are yes, the sun, it's like 20,000 of of 20, elephants a second yeah. or something. Uh, it, it's astounding. I mean, how can it yeah. do that and, and be 10 billion years old? And, and it's, it's like you're converting 5 million tons of matter into energy every second and 5 million tons is roughly this is one of those numbers i keep in my head uh seven fully loaded oil tankers mm -hmm. and think about how much energy seven fully loaded oil tankers can generate a lot right yeah, yeah. well and also can power a star uh you know is as as much heat as you feel if you put your hand up on a sunny day and you feel that warmth from the sun from the sun that that heat is in every direction mm -hmm. you know you, if you put your hand here or here or here it's that heat you can still feel it. If you're on the other side of the sun, you can still feel it. So that much heat is blowing away from the sun in, in four pi steridians, as we say in physics, yeah. in every single direction. It's a vast amount of energy. And it's just cranking through 5 million tons of, of fuel every second. And it's billion, like you said, billions of years old. And then you think, oh, the sun is very large. <laughs> you know, if it, can, if it can like blow through five, you know, imagine how rich you'd have to be to blow through, you know, $1,000 a second. And, and not worry about that for your whole life. It's kind of like that. It's like the sun is just blowing through that fuel and it, it hardly matters at, at, over the course of thousands of years. Over billions, it makes a difference, yeah. but over a human lifetime, it really doesn't. It, it makes me think of uh, first time, I guess, it's not, but from web telescope, even deep field images, right? where they're taking a, you know, an image of the sky that's as big as a grain of rice that's 20 miles away, and you can only see 300 million galaxies. Um, I, I, I will say it's, it's, it's that's that, that it, conceptually, that's right. It's like um, the, uh, the Hubble Deep Field, for example, yeah. is, is, is the same area of sky. And it was, what they wanted to do is say, look, we're going to find a blank area of the sky where we don't know of anything there or, or very little, and we're just going to look at it. Mm -hmm. And just let let the light build up for days and weeks with Hubble and see what we see. And the area on that, the area of sky that they found, uh, which was uh, in Ursa Major, the constellation, mm -hmm. is equivalent to like putting a grain of sand on your fingertip and holding it out at arm's length and see if I can. So it's like that much, a tiny, teeny, teeny piece of, yeah. of sky. And yet it had thousands of galaxies in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you can just say, well, count up how many galaxies are in that image. Uh, and assume we're seeing all of them, which is not really the case, but call it that. And then say, well, how many grains of sand could you cover the sky with? And it turns out it's a lot. And you multiply those two numbers together and you get, you know, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, something we knew. Um, but, but those deep fields and especially the JWST one, which 
sees even fainter galaxies because it's mm -hmm. a bigger telescope. Mm -hmm. And there are other reasons, but uh, yeah, I mean, the sky is just filled with galaxies. There's no such thing as an empty spot in the sky. And the no galaxies where you have, look, if you look far enough, there's something there. The galaxies have so many stars, and now it seems like the, the 21st century notion is you can't look any place and not find planets, too. And all of this is, um, yeah, well, is so not 20th century view of things. <laughs> well, if you think about it, a galaxy, <clears throat> say a galaxy has 100 billion stars, that's you know, a medium sized galaxy, and there are 100 billion of them. Yeah, that's 10,000 billion billion galaxies, that's a lot. Or excuse me, 10,000 billion billion stars. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's like, I think it's a, a sextillion stars is the number that comes to mind, uh, which wow. is you know, a number of people aren't even that familiar with. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a lot. And if, if we think these stars have planets, a lot of planets, a lot of planets. It's yeah, it's so, a lot. <laughs> so you did say your favorite place to visit, and I agree. Um, and so do you want to share that with the audience, your favorite place that you plan it or whatever you would yeah. visit? I think Fiji. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm glad to go to Fiji. That's good. Um, they have really good lime uh, <laughs> marmalade there. Um, <laughs> that's actually true. Uh, lime ginger marmalade I got from Fiji. And it always made me nice. But if I had to pick a planet besides Earth, I would pick Saturn. Yes. Uh, it's just, it's just incredible. And, it's so beautiful and so so unusual that when people see it through a telescope, they think you're faking it. They think you're holding mm -hmm. a picture up at the end of the telescope. It's like, no, you're seeing that planet. You're seeing those rings. Mm -hmm. uh, and to go there, I think it's – it's. Uh, I, I give a talk now based on that chapter in the book, and it's an hour-long talk, 45-minute long talk. Mm -hmm. And I had to pull so much stuff out of it because I couldn't <laughs> talk about everything I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to see with Saturn. The rings, there are all these weird features in the rings and things to talk about in there. Uh, every one of its moons is different. They're all so strange. We talked about Enceladus with the geysers and Titan with the atmosphere. Uh, there's another one that looks like it's made of styrofoam. There's another one that looks like a walnut. Uh, yeah. They are. There's one that looks like the Death Star, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's just phenomenal. And then the planet itself is really interesting. It's got some atmospheric features, um, so that, that would be really amazing to see up close. And I think of all these things, um, the thing that would really get me going would be to take a spaceship and fly over the ring slowly to see all the weird things in there. And then dive down into the planet's atmosphere, and I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. to actually be in a gondola, a pressure-sealed gondola, hanging underneath a hydrogen dirigible, floating in Saturn's atmosphere, and then looking up and seeing, uh, during the day, you could still see the rings. They would still be across the mm -hmm. sky. You'd see them. Um, but at night, they would be incredible to look up and see them and the planet shadow sort of rising across the rings and then watching the moons moving, moving back and forth. All of that uh, is possibly the most romantic thing I can think of. It's like a, it's like an Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, his old <laughs> stories about going to Mars and the, the flowery language he used. Uh, it, it's okay. kind of, it would feel like that. It would be living that experience because it just seems like a 19th century Mm -hmm. uh, Jules Verne story mm -hmm. rather than something that's real uh, and, and it's real and someday people may actually be able to do that yeah I, I really love that chapter and I, I was thinking and you did say specifically at the end this is where I would go yeah. but I could tell just by reading through I was like wow he's put a lot of effort and love into this so I was <laughs> like it's a it's a great chapter well thank you um, Saturn's hard the mm -hmm. the the rings get complicated because the rings aren't solid. They're made of trillions of chunks of ice. And they, they, they're just all on their own individual orbits, but they're affected by the gravity of the planet, the gravity of the moons. They bump into each other. And a lot of the, you get a lot of strange effects in the moons because of the interaction of gravity. And describing some of them, these features called propellers, mm -hmm. where yeah. you get a little moonlit in the ring and they start to draw the ring particles <clears throat> in. Uh, it winds up looking like, you know, an airplane propeller, this thing here with these two blades sticking out. Yeah, the physics of that, describing that's tough. And yes. the way the moons affect, you get ripples in the rings and everything um, from the tiny moon Daphnis. Uh, just all of this stuff was, um, 
I drew myself a lot of illustrations and have a lot of arrows and, you know, and <laughs> equations. And uh, there's a lot of math in this book that is hidden. Mm -hmm. I don't actually talk about the math, but it's there because I had to figure a lot of this stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, yeah. And so um, I spent so much time figuring this stuff out that how can you not want to write more about it? It's like, I've already put the effort in. I might as well. But also <laughs> Saturn is just so spectacular and so strange uh, and, and such a, such a fantasy setting mm -hmm. uh, because it just doesn't seem real that it, it was hard not to be excited every time I got to sit down, you know, I get up in the morning, have my coffee and think I get to write about Saturn again today. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, so I wonder, well, of course um, you have your pulse on all the new discoveries and probably reading uh, peer reviewed papers on the topic. Do you find yourself, I'm going to just send an email to this uh, scientist and get more details. Do you do that often? Um, I do that for uh, the newsletter okay. or for articles. I write for Scientific American now too. So I do contact authors a bit because um, sometimes I typically understand most of the science, but there are details maybe I don't understand and mm -hmm. I want to know more. Or is there something I see in the picture that they didn't write about? Or, or, you know, there's, some, there's something in the paper they're writing about this. And I think, oh, did they consider this issue? Mm -hmm. And I'll write them and say, hey, you know, I, you've thought about this or, or, you know, observing it this way. And most of the time they're like, yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not dummies. <laughs> we, just, we just can't put it all in the paper. And yeah. But sometimes um, uh, I've, I've written about uh, some, some, some objects and, I'll, and a scientist will contact me and say, huh. And then we'll, we'll <laughs> you know, get together and talk about it and then, observations are made and that's happened um a guy read a, a scientist read something i wrote about exoplanets and realized that they could be affected by dark matter mm -hmm. and um uh and, and wound up writing a theoretical paper about interaction of dark matter with um with brown dwarfs and giant planets yeah. brown dwarfs are like really 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 big planets uh and so it's like, good heavens, somebody read something I wrote and then, you know, got inspired to write a science article. Um, <laughs> so that, that's, that's fun, too. And uh, honestly, you know, inspiring scientists is phenomenal. Um, but the whole point here is to get people thinking about these places uh, out in space, whether they're worlds or galaxies or whatever, mm -hmm. and say they're real and we can understand them. And this is really exciting that we can discover how galaxies are born or what the universe looked like when it mm -hmm. was a couple hundred million years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love this stuff, obviously. And I, I, I love writing about it, even though uh, it's writing. Um, <laughs> uh, but I do love writing about it. And if, if somebody reads this and gets inspired or just goes, oh, that's cool, my, my job is done. Mm -hmm. And it, it happens. And any, any science communicator who tells you when somebody contacts them and said, I didn't know this about Saturn or sure. sea cucumbers or, or, <laughs> you know, tectonic plates, whatever science it is you study. When somebody, when somebody sends you a note and says, uh, that was amazing. And I'm really glad I read that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. You feel like uh, your, your entire week is made. It's really great. I don't know, Joanne, that's sort of like every episode of Read Science for us, I think. Uh, it's, it's pretty much like that. We see some of the greatest things. I have... Look at what you guys are doing. You're bringing these books, you know, that people haven't heard of, maybe, necessarily, yeah. and, and get, spreading them out to the audience. So, yeah, you guys, you that's know, what we want. It's like, go, go and read these great books. Okay, there's. I have one question that was about a fact that flew by and caught my attention, and it may be an unfair question if you don't have the answer on your fingertips. But you were talking about astronomers observing, I think, binary stars and measuring radial velocities. And it was dangerous work because they had to use hydrogen fluoride. And my question was like, <laughs> what were they using the hydrogen fluoride for? Yeah, this is, um, this is something I used to talk to my, uh, my friends about or my wife. And I'd say, you know, you know how you know how macho astronomy is. is that we're using chemicals that can kill you, yes. like, like really seriously kill you. Hydrogen fluoride is incredibly unstable gas, and it break if it breaks down into hydrogen and fluorine, you just have fluorine gas, and you really, yeah, really don't, don't want that. You don't want that. No. Yikes! Um, the thing about hydrogen fluoride is they would have like a little cube of it, yeah. and um, when light passes through it very specific wavelengths of light are absorbed by this gas. Yes. And it, it uh, uh, it's a series of them. 
and they are well placed in the electromagnetic spectrum, sort of in the rainbow of colors oh, that we okay. see, so that um, so that we can use them as like a benchmark. It's like having a ruler. Yep. So if the light from a star passes also through that cell, um, uh, you can measure exactly where um, the, the stars. How do I say the stars also have gases in their atmospheres that absorb yes. specific wavelengths of light. And so when you break that up into a spectrum, you can see those things. It's like a, there's like a band of light from the sun and there's chunks missing from it. It looks like, it looks a little bit like a DNA test. You see those little bands and everything. Yeah, 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 sure. That's the spectrum of the sun. Yeah. But you want to know what wavelengths those are. So you, you, you run your light through hydrogen fluoride and that gives you that benchmark. Okay. And then as the star is say moving back and forth yeah, or rotating can. or something like that, those wavelengths change through the Doppler shift but the hydrogen fluoride lines don't. So you have this benchmark and you see these lines moving. You can measure precisely the wavelengths and measure the uh, velocity of that star down to phenomenal resolution, like meters per second, walking speed. Uh, And that can betray the presence of a planet. And that's how astronomers Mm. were using using that gas in the 90s. So the hydrogen fluoride was a a particularly useful and convenient, not convenient, but a particularly useful spectrometric... Uh, standard yeah despite okay. its fatal danger yeah it's it so was, useful they use still, it yeah we have, we have other things we use now that are that are just as good and, and won't kill you if you drop it uh, and, and it shatters on the ground so yeah uh yeah uh, okay th- yeah that's that's why we thank uh, you i don't have to look <laughs> <up there. laughs> no worries so wow uh, you know what an hour has literally flown by i cannot believe it's it because it's because of me <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's great you know lots of lots of good information here and yeah, if you like this kind of stuff um check out his books maybe well if you don't this like one. this kind of stuff you will after you read the book <laughs> that's true the too that's you know, true. Alien skies and, yeah. yep here's one over and here the... oh yeah oh yeah look at that Look at that. I know I should get a bookshelf just so it's for product sit, placement. Yeah. yeah. Product placement. It would be <laughs> probably ideal. So yeah, definitely worthwhile. Of course, you can always go back and visit this book mm-hmm. as well. Death from Skies and, and Bad Astronomy. My first bad, bad astronomy. astronomy. Yeah, I know. One day I should read that's, Bad that's Astronomy. This one there. Boy, that's hard to there, do. Yeah, it, yeah is. it is. It is really hard. There it is. And I feel like this Wish is a flipped know. camera. So when I do something, yeah. I feel wait where's yeah, you yeah. never I can, know I can barely is. use one camera here yes uh, if i had two oh my god you'd be seeing you'd, you'd find out if i'm wearing pants or not which is the age-old question in, in zoom meetings yeah. we don't want to know in the pandemic yeah. era right i have i have fake suspenders they're decoys that you think i'm wearing pants oh this this is just a dicky this shirt ends at my yeah you know, <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us, or if you're watching afterwards. Great. Glad you could join us for this. And Phil, wonderful to have you on. Um, is there new, another book in the near future? Oh, God. Are you kidding? I just No, you're not. <laughs> so, when are you having another kid as you're holding your newborn? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, yeah. you'd be amazed at the number of people who go, yeah, I already got an idea. Yeah. Already working well, on it. And I'm like, sure, I, or, yeah. but some are cagey. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. But yeah, I'm working on one. And some of oh, nice. you like, oh, yeah, I'm working on one about this. Like people are different. Everybody's different. Writing you is know? one of those creative activities that the act of doing it tends to lead to more. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I do have ideas for other books, but I'm still trying to catch up with every all my other writing right now mm-hmm. and my life just in general. Uh, and then I'll, I'll start thinking about other projects. I have other things I want to do as well, other projects, but those will pop up as they, as you know, I, I have the ability to deal with them, I think. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, wonderful. Phil, thank you again for coming in and joining us. And Jeff, always good to see you. Thank right. you. Uh, go and read the book. It's, it's a yes, fabulous book. Yes, read the book. book. <laughs> read, yes, very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Thank you.